Hawkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything, geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redmond. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman, and you can find this show here at American Freedom Radio, AmericanFreedomRadio.com, as well as on my website, which is PorkinsPolicyReview.com. And of course, you can follow the show uh, here, live on AFR. You can also listen to the rebroadcast later on Friday nights on a host of other stations, including uh, Awake, PSN, uh, People's Internet Radio. And, of course, you can follow the show on iTunes, on TuneIn, and Stitcher. Uh, and, of course, on YouTube, if uh, if that is your uh, particular uh, mode of uh, uh, watching podcasts or listening to podcasts. Uh, quickly, I just want to um, uh, thank everyone again on Patreon. We've had a lot of people uh, signing up recently, so thank you uh, to everybody uh, that has been signing up. Uh, I just also want to mention that the... Uh, the new episode of uh, the subscriber podcast should be out uh, by the time you're listening to this. And that's, of course, uh, Tom Secker and I talking about the final episode of House of Cards, the final cut uh, in the, of course, the British version. So definitely check that out if you have not. But uh, I have a very special guest today, and I don't want to uh, eat up any more time with me rambling. And we are going to be joined by uh, writer John Atak. And... Uh, People, I hope everyone is, uh, I think the listeners should be fairly familiar with John's work because I've mentioned him on the show before, but John is the author of arguably the most important book uh, exposing Scientology or talking about Scientology and particularly its founder, L. Ron Hubbard. And that book, of course, is A Piece of Blue Sky. The updated uh, edition is Let's Sell These People, A Piece of Blue Sky. And I've mentioned it on the show numerous times. Uh, and along probably with uh, Russell Miller's Barefaced Messiah, one of the, the most important, if not the most important book uh, on Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard. And I want to give a big thank you to Jeffrey Augustine, uh, who put both of us in touch and, and helped make this interview possible. But anyway, uh, John Atak, how are you? I'm good, thank you, Piss. How are you? I'm doing very well. As I said, I'm, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Uh, I was I was gushing to uh, some friends the other day. I was saying... This is probably like up there, top five most important, you know, biggest guests I've had uh, on the show. So, uh, (laughs) but um, uh, John, why don't you give us a little bit of uh, a background? uh, You know, who is John Atak and how did you first get involved with the Church of Scientology? Uh, I was 19 years old, which is a very, very long time ago. (laughs) Uh, In 1974, um, a girlfriend had left me and I was a very distressed 19 year old. And I wound up in Scientology. They didn't recruit me. I walked in. Mm. Um, I was involved for nine years. I I had the great good fortune never to be on staff, as they say, never to be in the C organization. So I wasn't humiliated or abused. And that meant that, and I did, you know, 25 of the then 27 available steps of the bridge to total freedom. Um, so I'm officially uh, an operating Thetan Section 5. So, you know, watch yourself. <laughs> or magical feats at any moment. Um, but, I, you know, I, I was able to stand up to it when I left. And, and it took me a long time to understand why that was, why nobody was standing up to this thing. Mm-hmm. And people were just kind of going off into the corner and saying, don't attack them. Don't, don't say anything nasty about them. And you found out pretty soon why that was. I was harassed solidly for 16 years. After leaving, um, also, I mean, I've I've done a piece, a podcast with Chris Shelton about that, and gone into some some of the hideous details of being followed everywhere, and you know, having all your neighbours told that you're a child molester, and mm. you know, fake accusations of. I know, I, I I learned years after I'd left that I was apparently a heroin addict when I joined. So right, I right, yes, sir. According to them, um, and I've never in my life taken heroin. Let me let me put that in there um so i I basically i was first of all leaving because i thought 
Scientology had been betrayed. I thought that Hubbard was gone. I thought that David Miscavige and the, the new rulers were, you know, bad people. Um, but within a matter of weeks, I, I had material about Hubbard that for me was irrefutable, showing that he was he was a liar. Whatever else you could say about him, he contradicted himself so thoroughly and so utterly that he couldn't be believed. And it startled me when I talked to you know people I knew who were involved in Scientology, and they said, "Well," and gave some excuse, you know, mm-hmm. and said, "Well, yeah, of course he's a liar, but he's telling the truth here." You know, yeah, what right, I mean, right, right, right. Um, and of course, his Scientology is sold as the road to truth. And uh, Hubbard said, "Honesty is sanity." Then his incredible dishonesty um, was, you know, pause for thought. That for me, I went through the normal stages that so many people go through. You you lose faith in Hubbard, you you lose faith first in the organisation. In fact, then you lose faith in Hubbard, then you lose faith in the administrative and ethics technology, as they call it, and then eventually, and for many people, this doesn't happen. You lose faith in the Scientology counselling procedures. And for me, that all happened very quickly. And I found myself surrounded by thousands of people who um, were upset by Scientology, but still clung on to some belief in it. And that meant that I was, you know, not only being attacked by the Guardian's Office of Scientology, as it was then called, uh, and its harassment division, I was also being attacked by the independent (laughs) Scientologists. Mm. Until it got to the point where they started to realize that I was their only defense against the mother cult. So, you know, a lot of people shamefacedly came to me and said, well, we're very sorry we said nasty things about you. Will you help defend us in our litigation? You know? And which I ended up doing. So, for example, um, there, there were some rogue individuals who went to Copenhagen and lifted the advanced levels of Scientology from the organization there by pretending to be on a mission from America. And they ended up um, in litigation in Denmark and in the UK. I spent 10 years working on their case in the UK and putting together a case that I felt Scientology wouldn't be willing to answer in court. And that proved to be the case on the first day of the trial. They gave in and capitulated. But so I was involved in, oh, I don't know, about 150 court cases around the world trying to help people, um, which were mainly successful. Uh, I think the Cult Awareness Network, we had, I think they had 54 suits and they won the first 53. So um, I became very familiar with the US and um, English legal procedure through that time. I worked on about 200 media pieces. You mentioned Russell Miller's superb biography of Hubbard. I was the researcher for that. And he, in in fact, had my manuscript and worked from my manuscript, though his book was published before mine. Um, He added a great deal to it, he and his wife, Renata. He's just an astonishing writer, one of the the great biographers of of the age. And we're very lucky that he turned his attention to Ron Hubbard. (laughs) Um, I worked on lots of other books um, over the years, lots of articles. But I I think essentially what fascinated me was, you know, how does it work? Why is it that so many intelligent, highly qualified, competent people are drawn into this entirely fictional (laughs) construction? You know, Hubbard, you know, as I research deeper and, you know, I mean, I've, I've recently read a scandal sheet about me published by Scientology where they say I, I talk with a handful of, um, you know, people who are upset with Scientology, and that's where my information comes from. Well, I took testimony or had interviews with or letters from or books from 150 people to write, let's sell these people a piece of blue sky. So, and I I had documents from collections all over the world. I was the first person to get his Navy records, his FBI records. Mm. And these are, they're absolutely consistent with one another. Indeed, In Hubbard's own biographies, the one I always come back to, which I only discovered a couple of years ago, he, in 1950, gave a lecture called uh, Introduction to Dianetics, which the reason I didn't see it until a couple of years ago is because the cult only published it a couple of years ago. Um, It was published on the, it, it was recorded on the 23rd of September in 1950. 
And in it, Hubbard is really quite honest about his background. He admits that he dropped out of university after the first year, was put on probation because he was a, an awful student. <laughs> Elsewhere, he, he would claim to have a, a degree as a civil engineer, a degree as a mathematician, and of course, his famous PhD from Sequoia University. Um, he admits that he wasn't wounded during World War II, where later he would say that he was crippled and blinded and cured himself through the use of Dianetics. Um, so I put together many of these things. I became fascinated by the contradictions in his own writings. Because if you're going to a fanatic and saying, well, look, you know, here, here is university grade sheets, which show that he got a grade F in atomic and molecular physics. So he wasn't a nuclear physicist. Then they say, that's a forgery. Right, of course. So what I had to do, I felt, was to find his statements as recorded. You know, the crippled and blinded is from a handwritten document called My Philosophy in 1965. In 1957, having said he was crippled and blinded at the end of you know, World War II, in 1957, in a what's called a professional auditor's bulletin called Communication and Isness, he says um, that on the 25th of July, he was in Hollywood and he beat up three petty officers. So you've got all yeah. of these contradictions, and you put them together and you end up with a guy who... Um, now, if you look at, uh, there's a book, it was originally called What to Audit uh, in 1952, and it was renamed Scientology, A History of Man, which begins famously, this is a cold-blooded and accurate account of your last 63 trillion years or whatever, 60 trillion years, um, which, of course, goes way beyond before the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang and the universe we're in at you know, 13, 14 billion years ago we're into trillions with hubbard and the thought that he managed to sit down and in two weeks map the entire history of the last 60 trillion years with only the assistance of amphetamines is really quite astonishing um his oldest son who joined him at this time uh, having been abandoned at the age of eight uh, he's 18 and he joins his father and he's very excited and his father says right sit down on the couch Here's a load of here are a load of amphetamines. Take these and tell me what you see. Mm. And that's how the research was done. And that you know, I interviewed one person after another who had seen him taking drugs. I found a lecture where he talked about having been a phenobarbital addict, very dangerous drug, a barbiturate drug. Um, you know, I made myself a guinea pig in one of these experiments. He says in that lecture, um, he was a bit more candid in 1950 than than in later years about his experiences. I talked with the woman who uh, rescued him when he was researching the third section of the operating Thetan, the upper levels, uh, the wall of fire, as he called it, uh, a woman called Virginia Downsborough. And she had to rescue him from Las Palmas uh, on Gran Canaria, the island of Gran Canaria. And she said that when she arrived, and she was still actually doing this stuff with people so she was a total believer you know she, when i first interviewed her she she told the guy who was with me to be quiet because there were people in the next room doing ot3 and yet she was telling us that that he was round the bend he he was crazy when she arrived he thought he was being attacked by these little entities which he called body thetans um he hadn't eaten for days uh, and she said he was surviving on a shelf load of drugs. And she did a gesture with her hands to show a shelf about two feet long. Um, and was this after his motorcycle accident? No, the motorcycle accident is after he's formed the sea organization. That's around, that's mm. 1962, I think. Um, this is in 1966 mm. when he gets the idea of, you know, because he's been declared a, an illegal alien in uh, the uk so they won't let him back in there are uh, he's had the nasty um accounts of, of of him and his cult in victoria australia where scientology has been banned which was a rather silly thing to do i think but didn't work out too well um there's an inquiry in ontario there's an inquiry in south africa and he's starting to feel you know, massively unloved. So he puts to sea thinking, you know, I can be in international waters and I can have my own little country, which he pretty much did. Mm. Um, you know, as, as you know, treating people incredibly abusively, a man who in 1950 had come to save us from all of the um, unconscious reactions we had to trauma. 
was now actually traumatizing people. He was throwing them overboard, you know, from a height you know, beyond the high diving board of the swimming pool. And often there were people who couldn't swim um, and that, you know, have a rope tied around their ankles and be pulled back up. He was putting children, uh, one as young as four, in the disgusting chain lockers of the ship, you know, which would be full of bilge water and rats and um, sewerage, basically, uh, and completely dark. You know, imagine a four-year-old child. Who would do that? Mm. Um, Ron Hubbard would do it. Uh, he had a he had a couple um, Charlie Reesdorf and and a, a woman push a peanut around the wooden deck of of the ship as a punishment with their noses uh, ending up with their faces you know splintered and and yet he creates this astonishing devotion in people where that you know they they can't imagine him ever done having done anything wrong and so of course. From their perception, he's a, a sort of godlike character, and I am a terrible, evil person, you know, a suppressive person in his terms. It, I became fascinated by that inability to consider evidence and realize that we all suffer from it to some extent. We have this sense of certainty, what the psychologist William James called the noetic sense. We are sure, we are convinced that something is right. So you get things like, you know, the the Challenger study where people were asked to write down, you know, where they were and what they were thinking when the, the Challenger blew up, uh, incidentally, during the same week that Elrond Hubbard died. Mm. And, you know, a couple of years later, these accounts are given to these people and they, you know, after they'd, they've written what they think now. And I think something like 10% agreement between the accounts that and one guy when shown his account his original account says well look that's my handwriting but that's not what happened and it says <laughs> there's a great deal about our capacity to you know che- you know to feel certain to know that we're right and to therefore you know through cognitive dissonance or confirmation bias or whatever to push away anything that disagrees with what we believe I mean, I, I often tell a story when I was about 17, um, I was approached by a, a born again Christian who wanted to recruit me. And I stood on the street with him for two hours, poor guy. And, you know, perfectly friendly conversation. You know, I was very interested in these ideas he was putting forward. And I, I just read the Gospels, not as a, as a Christian, just as, you know, out of interest because they're so vital to our culture. By this, you know, I stopped believing in God when I was 13. Um how on earth I got into Scientology. I suppose it serves me right, really. Should have just kept living in God. But this guy, he, I'd worried him and upset him so much that he he walked away from me backwards. He backed away from me. And he said, um, I don't understand the Bible, but I know it's all true. Mm. And it's that division, which, which we all do. It's a, it's a perfectly normal human thing. It, it's also perfectly normal to believe that other people do it, but that we don't, you know. Um, and it's how do you get through that? And so, in writing, let's sell these people a blue sc- piece of blue sky. I wrote it from the perspective of a Scientologist, going, well, you know, I'm not going to sit here with a you know a load of invective about this guy. Uh, I'm not going to you know tear it down. I'm going to conscientiously take one piece of information after another, and and show these things. I was very pleased when um, Stacy Young. Uh, Stacy Brooks would later be Stacy Minton. When she left the cult, and she said to me that she'd written the so-called dead agent pack, attacking Bent Corridon's uh, book about Hubbard, and she said that when she read my book, she couldn't find a single thing to rebut, <laughs> yeah. which which was just wonderful. In fact, the cult produced uh, sixty points many of which all you need to do is look in the index. So they, they say, you know, he says that Scientology was banned in Victoria in 1965. Fact. And you go, well, yeah, this is called history. It's in chronological <laughs> order. You'll find on a later page where I say it was lifted. Mm. Um, oh, well, and if I, I mean, that's, uh, again, your credits it with this book. I mean, it's, it's, it is, uh, it's written um, in a very, uh, I don't want to say academic way, but the structure of the book certainly lends to that and everything is so well sourced i mean again if it's people nice. are are yeah. you know curious about uh you know major sort of uh 
like you say, facts and Scientology, mm-hmm. and down to the minutia of little things. Uh, and mm-hmm. everything is so well. So I mean, there's nothing in the book, uh, like you said, that Scientology could probably point to and say that's wrong. I mean, much of what you uh, reference are either Hubbard's own words or uh, internal documents from Scientology, their own archives, uh, or yep. the you know the 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 few available um, uh, newspaper you know like uh, particularly Hubbard's early life. I mean, you reference some uh, newspapers from his uh, hometown and stuff like yep. that. Uh, I mean, it's it's all right there, um, and uh, you really do. It, it is a wonderful the way you kind of build up the case, uh, and I love that you start you know with your own personal story. Uh, and then you get into Hubbard's, you know, childhood and, uh, you know, all through the 50s and, and Wichita and all the, the nuttiness of that. And then on to, uh, you know, when he's in the Sea Org and the, the Commodore's Messengers, all that stuff I want to get to. But, um, John, I, I think, though, the the, uh, uh, the what I loved about your book so much is is, in fact, the, the, the image you paint of Hubbard, because um, and I don't know if you if, if you would agree with this, but I would say. Um, nowadays there, there have been, I don't know, there, there seems like there's this effort to almost portray Hubbard as kind of like a goofy nut job or Mm. a man who was, who was mentally ill and almost like tragically developed Scientology to Mm. help himself. And he's almost been, and, and maybe that's, you know, time heals all wounds. Uh, and now, you know, it's like, uh, like people here, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, love George Bush uh, in comparison to Donald Trump. You know, um, we, we, we tend to, um, you know, sort of excuse a horrible people later in life. Oh, well, they were misunderstood, blah, blah, blah. And uh, like, you know, I mean, for instance, I liked um, Lawrence Wright's Going Clear. But yeah, I book. did find at times, you know, it was almost this. Um, and that I think is more Lawrence Wright's uh, style of writing. But, you know, that sort of portraying Hubbard towards the end is this sort of sad man, you know, if only he had gotten the help that he needed or something like that. And I would say in your um, your writing in, in Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky, I mean, you, you portray Hubbard as a much more um, sinister individual yeah. uh, and someone that knew full well what he was doing and mm-hmm. seems to be driven almost entirely by his own avarice. You know, and, and uh, I mean, greed seems to be really what kind of drove Hubbard. So I don't know. I mean, John, what's your, your take on that? This sort of uh, the, the way that Hubbard is being interpreted nowadays? Well, let me say the first thing. A, a, a dear friend of mine contacted me a couple of weeks ago, and she said that she was very confused about Hubbard's motivation. She was somebody who worked with Hubbard for several years and is now you know writing her autobiography. And she wanted me to tell her what Hubbard's motivation was. And it, it made me sort of think, oh, yeah, that we used to think about things in that way back in the 70s, didn't we? You know, right. what is it? What was the thing that happened that made this happen? And I don't think that, you know, that one moment of motivation exists for anybody. I think lots of things happen. Uh, and Hubbard is, is very complicated in some ways. Um, he is... And, and I'm not qualified to say this, but I've I've read a lot of books about it, so I'm going to say it. And I've talked to various psychiatrists and people. He was a narcissist. He was a malignant narcissist, and he was a vulnerable narcissist as opposed to a grandiose narcissist, which means he was very sensitive to what people said about him. Um, I worked on a, a documentary, which I st- I still think is the best documentary. Uh, the Shrinking World of Owen Hubbard is actually without parallel that's the best documentary about hubbard um made in 1968 by charlie nan but but after that comes the secret life of Aaron hubbard which i worked on in the 90s and the producer jill robinson actually gave me all of her interviews at, at the end so of course the, the program's about an hour long but the interviews go to about 30 hours and among these interviews are interviews with Barbara Cloden, who was Hubbard's girlfriend during his second marriage in 1950, if we want to get into his sexual mores and what an expert he was on the family, of course, his yes. girlfriend during his second marriage before after he'd abandoned his second wife and child they'd had together, who he claimed was not his. Um, and she went on to become a psychologist 
And I think her interview is up on Tony Ortega's um, Underground Bunker. And you have her talk, you know, giving a definition of Hubbard and what he was like. Curiously, there was an interview also with Jim Ding Kelsey, who nursed Hubbard after the motorcycle accident you mentioned um, in Queens in New York. And Ding Kelsey also, after he left Hubbard, became a psychologist. So you've got two people 20 years apart who lived with Hubbard, um, you know, in the same apartment with Hubbard. And both of them come to the same conclusions about his mental condition, that, that he was depressive. He would spend days in bed uh, sulking, not wanting to talk to anybody. You know, the, the great superhuman Ron yes, Hubbard. Right, of course, you know. <laughs> he was vindictive. He was paranoid. Um, that comes over again and again. Um, and he's so totally self-involved. Charlie Nairn, who, who made the absolutely brilliant Shrinking World of Aaron Hubbard, told me that, you know, when he arrived at the ship in uh, Bizerte in Tunisia, I think it is, uh, at one o'clock in the morning, having told Granada TV that he was being sued by Hubbard for the last documentary he'd mm. made, uh, Faith for Sale, he was kind of, well, oh, here I am to, to make this thing, and this guy's not going to talk to me. And he saw Hubbard walking along the deck. So he called up and he said, you know, can I come aboard? And um, he spent two hours talking with Hubbard before switching the camera on and doing the interview. And he, when he contacted me a couple of years ago, he said, you know, I was really, I, I've been really distressed because I feel that I didn't get him to say on camera what he told me. And Nan said, I, I said to him, it's a scam, isn't it? And Hubbard said, of course it's a scam. Just straight out. You know, nobody else is listening. Nobody's recording. It's a scam. And then just quite naturally said, that must make you feel very isolated, very lonely. Yeah. That, that you can't share this with people. And Hubbard fell for it and started going on about how sad it is when you're conning people. That, really? You know, yeah. So very just completely self-involved. And so Nan said to him, well, why do you do it? And he said, well, it's very nice every evening to bring your wife $10,000 in cash. You know, this is 1968. So this is like, you know, a, of money. a lot of money. And But the, the main reason is that I like to uh, hook the clever ones and reel them in. And you suddenly hear this kind of 10-year-old, you know, who... He's the fat kid, he's spotty, he's got red hair, he's despised and disliked by his school fellows, he's phobic of horses, so would later claim that he was breaking broncos at the age of three. Right. With, the, yeah. with the, the Blackfoot Indians, right? Blackfoot Indians, yeah, he was two when he was, in, in one account, when he was made a blood brother. Um, <laughs> but absolutely, absolutely monstrously ridiculous. Um, and yet he... So you see him at 10 years old. He's unloved. He's, you know, apart from by his maternal grandfather. And it's curious that uh, several cult leaders grew up in the households of their maternal, uh, of a grandfather, um, Sun Myung Moon, Rajneesh uh, among them. And I, I sort of wonder, I mean, this thing about motivation, there's, there's this thing about, oh, Hubbard was probably sexually abused as a child. And that's why he turned into this thing. Now, Having poured through all the available material, we had an interview with his aunt, Margaret Roberts. We had interv an interview with one of his school friends. We've got letters, you know, around the time of his teens. And Jerry Armstrong, who had access to the archive, Vaughan Young, who had access to the archive, Stacey Young, um, Shona Foxness. I've talked with lots of people who saw the material in the archive, and that archive is massive. Jerry Armstrong collected an enormous amount of material about Hubbard. And Hubbard was a hoarder. So, you know, he found his baby shoes, for example, in this box that That's had been right. moved around the world after him. Um, and there is nothing to suggest sexual abuse of any kind. Um, I think the contrary is true, that the expectation placed upon him is by his grandfather that he was going to be a superman. That is maybe in the background. But we find him... Even as a teenager, he says he started studying hip hypnosis at 16 um, in Dianetics, Modern Science and Mental Health, which is, uh, what, 23 years later. Uh, he is talking about developing Dianetics with hypnosis. And a year later, he says, never believe a hypnotist in mm -hmm. the book Science of Survival, which I used as the title of a paper about his um, 
use of hypnosis and his own admissions of his use of hypnosis. I'm not saying anything about it. It's all you know, in quotation from what he said. He became involved with Alistair Crowley's uh, ideas at the age of 16. He read the Book of the Law by Crowley. And that would be the center of his world. When I, I wrote a paper called uh, Possible Origins for Dianetics and Scientology, where I traced, uh, I think there are 120 ideas in there that Hubbard uses that you can trace to somebody else. But I also showed that Hubbard referred to the person that I traced them to. So of those 120 ideas, 60 belong to Alistair Crowley. So there's well, your... Of course, the, the whole Jack Parsons, uh, um, oh. his whole time in California, um, mm. which has been, you know, that, that and that's sort of become now, uh, I don't know, acceptable to talk about openly. Yeah, as it should be. I, I mean, it, I actually, you know, to find out what I did find out, and and some of the material in Blue Sky was original about the uh, Parsons uh, thing. For example, it had never been put in print before that Parsons sued Hubbard in Florida after Hubbard had emptied his bank account, took, I think, $35,000 from him, and started this scheme to to buy and sell boats. Right, right, right. And that was with Parsons' girlfriend, right? His ex-girlfriend? That Well, yeah, and it, it just gets crazier and crazier. Parsons' girlfriend, Sarah Hollister, as, as she would become Sarah Northrup, was mm. the sister of Parsons' wife, as well as being <laughs> Parsons' girlfriend. You know, so, you know, this is... But, yeah. but I... <laughs> I dealt with the OTO in in the UK and in and the two the, the California and the New York OTO and I found these people you know they were very polite they were very helpful mm. uh, it you know it, I I think Crowley was uh, I don't know I, I think it's crazy I, I it's a you know I would rather if I'm going to look at mythology I'd rather look at it through the eyes of Machia Eliard or Joseph Campbell than the eyes of Alistair Crowley. Yeah, me too. Crowley is frankly not a good scholar, and 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 his um, sexual habits and drug habits are a little extreme for me. Let me put it that way. You know, um, Hubbard was besotted with him. You know, of course, calls him my very good friend, Alistair Crowley. Which uh, the, the feeling wasn't reciprocated. They never met, and uh, Crowley, in a letter, called him a lout. You know, and they couldn't understand the idiocy of these louts, which was kind of strange because what Parsons and Hubbard were doing was the eighth degree of the OTO practice. It wasn't something they'd invented. They were using that. And I think, again, I was the first to realize that as I studied the things. I was very lucky. I had access to so many people. John Simons, who was Crowley's uh, literary executor and biographer talked to me along the way so I, you know i got a pretty good idea of what was going on there he was fun because he he said he made me his literary executor and he, he did it because he knows you know i hated him <laughs> <laughs> he had this but he but he knew that he would preserve the work which he did um so yeah in terms of getting into his motivation or what happened to him um he was depressive he was paranoid um, he was a multiple drug abuser. He was an alcoholic. Um, Jesse Prince has talked about the um, trips to hospital at the end of his life because of his alcoholism, his chronic alcoholism, um, you know, that his uh, pancreas and liver were malfunctioning by that time. Mm. Um, chronic smoker, too, obviously. 100 cigarettes a day, which, you know, by that time, by that amount of nicotine, you really are in a, a major <laughs> yeah. Cycle situation you know um and he used to complain you know to his teenage messengers that you know he wished he could give up smoking and you're going and this is the guy that's the founder of narcanon you know he can't well, give of course up. i mean he he shouldn't even yeah i mean he should just be able to kind of flip it off right you know i mean just yeah. turn a switch in his head and not be addicted to anything um yeah. you know and this as you said i mean narcanon i mean this is the whole um well, I mean, that again just sort of speaks volumes to this idea of, uh, of, um, you know, operating Thetans as being super people, you know, supermen or, or having super abilities. Yes. Uh, and yet so many of them are plagued with the everyday. I mean, you can't kind of separate, you know, the everyday problems of addiction and stuff like that, uh, simply because you're OT8 or, or whatever. 
Um, and, and Hubbard is a prime example of this, of course. I mean, he seems to be the one indulging the most out of everybody. Um, oh, absolutely. It, it just, it's scary when you, you know, and, and in the early 50s, of course, when he launches Dianetics, amphetamines are still legal and, and available. You don't even need a prescription. Mm. And so, Again and again in lectures in 1950 and 51, he tells people, use amphetamines. It, it improves the, the counseling experience, you know. Um, and so you have him using barbiturates, downers, amphetamines, uppers. I, I've spoken with a couple of people who, who he uh, said he'd taken LSD to, even though it was something he would ban later on. Um, I, he was, yeah. But, but there's there's this wonderful lecture in 1952 in December 52 and the so-called Philadelphia doctorate course. You know, come and listen to me for six weeks and I'll give you a doctorate. You yeah, know? Right, right. Can't be can't be bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, where where he talks about um, his uh, association, you know, with these these drug states. You know that um, he's become dependent upon this thing and the most i think the most probably the most important statement he ever made which somebody pointed out to me at the bunker and i'd forgotten it in these lectures in 52 he talks about you know there's this assertion in scientology that life is a game and you know that's all it is uh it's a game and you'll be reborn and you'll be playing the game over and over again but he then talks about the game and he says well in the game you have a player and you have pieces, and the player must keep the rules hidden from the pieces. But then he says, you also have the game maker, and the game maker doesn't follow the rules. So when you find that the founder of this drug rehabilitation uh, organization, Narconon, was himself a multiple drug abuser, when you find that this guy who is um, the world's leading expert on families abandoned the two children of his first marriage, the one child of his second marriage. And of course, you know, in Shrinking World of Aaron Hubbard, the only hostile interview of Hubbard on uh, camera, when he's asked about his second wife, he's told you that he was married back in the 30s, and he's told you that he's now married to another woman, Mary Sue Whip. But he says, I had no second wife. So you've got this bizarre situation that mathematically he had a first wife and a third wife. Yes, right. According to his own thinking. I mean, also in that interview, he's asked uh, about reincarnation. And uh, he pauses when he's asked if he believes in it. And Charlie says, uh, but your followers believe in it. He goes, oh, yes, you know, they believe in it. <laughs> and, of course, we have a 1938 letter sent to his first wife. Um, where he says he does not believe in immortality other than through the arts. There is no survival after death. And yet here he will be creating this whole subject based on reincarnation. Oh, so, and of course, when he died, I mean, it was assumed, I mean, it was assumed he didn't really die, that he, you know, entered onto the next plane of next existence, level. right? You know, I mean, well, that they, said he, they said he was researching the next level, which you couldn't <laughs> do inside your body. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know, which and which is such a bizarre way of uh, announcing the death of your founder. And, I, and when you watch that video, you can, the gasp in the crowd um, mm. when they, they're sort of putting it together. Um, I want to uh, jump back to, to something, uh, John, because it was uh, in your book. I mean, you really kind of um, you, you hammer it in, which I think is great. And, and you've read another book, too, about um, Scientology, the cult of greed. Right. I want to say is the is the word. Yeah. Time. yeah. Um, and, you know, something that really kind of just I don't know. I remember when I first read uh, Let's Tell These People a, a Piece of Blue Sky, it really jumped out at me. But the, the fact that Hubbard, till the day he died, collected a naval pension. Um, yep. I mean, just it, it. I mean, just talk about that alone, because I mean, it, it really does kind of just hammer in the point again that that so much of this uh, religion, uh, the, you know, the, this whole sort of empire is predicated on uh, money, and again, bilking people out of money. Well, yeah, the, there's a, a policy letter written by Hubbard um, in the millions and millions of words that he wrote. Um, which is called hypergraphia, I believe, uh, the state of not being able to stop writing. And he is listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most prolific writer in all history, though I'd like to see the list of publications that they worked from because I'm sure that there are, you know, 
things yeah. to be checked in there. That, that yeah, been... there has to be so, so somebody else. But non- nonetheless, the, the governing policy of Scientology is make money, make more money, make others produce so as to make even more money. Uh, that is not um, bring spiritual liberation to the universe, but make money, make more money. And making the able more able. Yeah, making the able more able. That one went kind of by the way during the <laughs> 1950s, I fear, and money became the primary objective. Um, I mean, it, that brings me to a point, actually, which is to do with motivation. And my colleague, Yuval Laor, um, has put forward the idea that Hubbard suffered from temporal lobe epilepsy. And if you look to the Bear Fideo traits for this, there are 18 traits. Uh, the first time I read them, when Yuval showed them to me, when I we uh, did a gig in Toronto, we did a week of amusing talks in Toronto about Scientology, um, and Yuval showed up there. And the first time I saw these 18 traits, I immediately could see that 17 of them were things he had. Now, you don't even need the majority of them to have temporal lobe epilepsy. Curiously, Yuval did a, an interview with Chris Shelton, and they, you know, Chris didn't get into enough examples, I don't think. It, it all went by a little too quickly. Um, so I don't think it was very convincing. However, by strange quirk of fate, a retired professor of neurology, who I think was Harvard professor of neurology, um, emeritus, they say, don't they? He's not retired. He was yes, emeritus. Right, right, right. Old soldiers never die. They simply fade away. Um, that he had this bizarre coincidence. He was there when temporal lobe epilepsy was uh, first made public in the 70s. He was at the lecture where it happened. He spent 30 years collecting material about Hubbard just out of curiosity. It was his <laughs> hobby. And he got hold of Yuval after this talk and said, I'd never thought about it. But yes, temporal lobe epilepsy. So hypographia, the, you know, having to keep writing uh, is the first thing on the list. And you go down the list and, and you find, yeah, here are these traits. Now, that would mean that we could say, uh, you know, oh, well, he was kicked in the head by a horse and and that made it all happen. I'm not sure how much that changes the view. If I look at Stalin or, or Hitler and what they did, then, of course, I can sit down and say, well, you know, I mean, uh, Hitler built great roads. He was a vegetarian. You know, um, he brought in the first animal rights legislation. He was the first person in government to say that smoking was probably linked to lung cancer. Richard Dole didn't get there till the 1950s. Um, and you can sort of say all those things and then you kind of go and then there was the Vansi conference and the right. deaths and all of this i think with any human being you have to take everything into account i um a few months ago i was pleading with a hubbard aide a guy who worked very closely with him for a decade who's saying oh he's been misrepresented and he was a lovely man and all of this and i'm saying please write a book you know tell us your experience because it's not about you know, I'm right about Hubbard. He was a totally evil human being. There is no such thing. However, when you're dealing with somebody as narcissistic as Hubbard, you do have to be careful. He may well have done some good in his life. You know, mm. um, Hitler was apparently very good with uh, German shepherd dogs, you know, so let's put that on the when, when he gets to the pearly gates. Let's put that on the list. Um Hubbard may well have done some good. He may well have encouraged some people to achieve things that they would not otherwise have achieved. But was he devious? Was he deceptive? Was he a pathological liar? Uh, yes. Um, did he care about other people? Was he compassionate? I don't think so. I've, I've not found any evidence of that. I found the kind of mystical manipulation where you set things up to make it look as if you're compassionate so people will think you're compassionate. but. I, you know, for example, when he was given um, news of his um, oldest boy by his third marriage, Quentin, when he was given news of his death, he said, well, you know, that's going to cause bad publicity. You imagine your own yeah. child has died and, yeah. and you're worried about the publicity. And I think that defines Hubbard, that, that he was terrified. He was utterly self-involved. And as with most paranoid people, he was trying to control everything around him. I mean, uh, 
Howard Shoma, Homer Shoma, who was on the ship, testified about Hubbard um, doing the menus for the ship every day, talking about, you know, micro control. And so how, how many variations of rice and beans are there? You know, but every <laughs> day had to look at, you know. um, he was a man who, who thought himself a god. And in fact, he is not a good example. Um, he left a wake of destruction. I, I was horrified to find how high the suicide rate has always been in Scientology. I, I did some numbers a few about 20 years ago, um, and it reckoned to be about 10 times higher than the normal suicide rate in the Western world. So you really? got because that, that is not uh, a, a topic that is really touched upon uh, much. No, and, and it, I think the ability to conceal, you know, hiding things is just phenomenal. That even years later, uh, people who are involved in the cover up and harassment, the Guardian's office division, um, still won't tell us. They still won't mm. admit everything they did, uh, even to the extent that when Tony Ortega wrote his brilliant Unbreakable Miss Lovely about the Paulette Cooper harassment that he interviewed people who still felt that they were right to have done these awful things to Paul out because <laughs> set her up for murder basically yeah. frame her yeah for a bomb threat and um in a very elaborate way try and get her to commit suicide which of course was Hubbard's order that she should be incarcerated in a, a mental mental institution or a prison um under the order he wrote, Operation Freakout, it, you know, again, th there's a book called Arrows in the Dark where this former Guardian's office guy tries to excuse Hubbard and say, well, he didn't know about any of these things. Well, I did uh, 11 hours of interviews with a guy called Brian Rubinek. Rubinek was actually the guy in charge of the break-ins to American government agencies in the 1970s. So he's the guy that directed Michael Meisner to infiltrate the Justice Department, the IRS, you know, and steal a horde of documents, just, you know, a room full, floor to ceiling of documents that they stole, which had nothing to do with Scientology, many of them. They were just ways of um, sticking it to the Justice Department. You know, not that that's necessarily a bad thing to do. And right, certainly right, absolutely. <laughs> IRS, and, and they, they caught the Drug Enforcement Administration with some rather tricky material that they released too. I think some of the um, MK Ultra, MK Naomi files possibly leaked through Scientology as well. So, really, you know, I believe it, it's not impossible because of the time period that it was happening. I've not been able to confirm that because, of course, uh, they don't want to talk about it. No, of course. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it didn't, didn't exist. Or... <laughs> but... But you, you go back into that time. I spent 11 hours interviewing Rubinek in 1986 over three evenings. And he later in a deposition, on his deathbed, in fact, in a deposition for a court case, uh, I was hired to work on the court case. I'd never seen this deposition all the way, where he bragged about having um, tricked me uh, into believing that Ron Hubbard knew nothing about the break-ins. And in fact... It's in, you know, as I say, the sense of certainty and, and memory and what we believe to be true. At the end of the interviews, when I knew he, he told me everything he was going to tell me, and, it, and the whole story was about, you know, he'd been Hubbard's bodyguard on the ship. He'd run the break-ins, you know, so he was very well placed to know what he was saying. He was, the whole thing, the whole slant was Hubbard knew nothing about this. And at the end of the interview, I said, well, actually, I interviewed Ken Urquhart in March of 1986. And he told me that he was on the bridge of the ship one day with Mary Sue and Ron. And Hubbard said, how are the break-ins in Washington going? Which, considering it came from Ken Urquhart, who's absolutely dedicated to Ron Hubbard, I, you know, took to be a, you know, a statement of, and, and I think the other thing is the German thing, a, a, a fish stinks from the head down, they say. Um, well, he had to, I mean, of course. I mean, it's comical to think that Hubbard wasn't orchestrating all of this or knew. Uh, I mean, he, he, John, you were just mentioning before, he micromanaged rice and beans on the ship. Yeah. There's no way he wasn't, you know, uh, asking questions every 30 seconds about the break-in, what they got. and uh, I mean, this was his whole uh, ethos was, you know, um, like the, the, the whole Meisner operation. I mean, this is, this sort of goes to the core of uh, their of Scientology's um, assault on on virtually anybody. I mean, in this case, it was the U.S. government. 
but uh, you know anyone that crossed them. This was sort of the the, the their mo. Um, so yeah, it, it's comical to think he didn't know uh, or that he didn't even order it. You know. Yeah, and I mean it's the difference between the original version of A Piece of Blue Sky from 1990, and please don't anybody out there buy it because it the version that that's available is a pirate version of A Piece of Blue Sky. I, I'm not getting royalties from that. I, oh, really? I, I stopped getting royalties way back. Um, and they decided, the publisher decided they could put it out print on demand and sod me and my rights. That's nice. Um, nice. Yeah, it's, it's an unfortunate thing. Publishing is, you know, like Hollywood, it's it's not a clean business, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, and, you know, thank God for print on demand and, you know, places like Create Space and Lightning Source where you can publish your own material. Um given you know my experiences with publishers but um we were hit with a, a, a suit when blue sky came out in or, or, or and when it was on the way out in 1989 and we i have i have 10 precedents in law in england and the us i think that probably puts me ahead of anybody else alive 10 precedents you know and one of the us president precedents is a Piece of Blue Sky is the only book ever to be restrained from publication in the US that did not conflict with national security. I think the only other book was Victor Marchetti's book about the CIA. Um, but we we suffered prior restraint um, because Scientology managed to persuade a judge to do this. And what had happened was that, that you'd had the Salinger case where J.D. Salinger complained that um, extracts had been made from over 70 of his letters by a biographer. And even though they were publicly available, they were in a university collection, he could still choose to publish them himself and therefore make money from them. So this notion of unpublished copyright came in. The Hemingway estate, the uh, Stravinsky estate, both sued on these grounds. And then Russell Miller was sued. Um and he basically won the suit, but the judge advised him that if if um, Henry Holt went ahead with publication, there was a likelihood that they would be sued under this precedent. And so Henry Holt dropped the book in the US, uh, sadly. Um, but so we were attacked on this, you know, with the same basis. And it meant that I had to paraphrase 60 passages in that original book. When we republished in 2013, that precedent was gone. And all 60 of those paraphrase passages are back. What's important about that is that a number of those are orders from Hubbard to the Guardian's office telling them how to harass people. <laughs> you know, this was unpublished copyright material, you know. Right, um, right. I added a, f a few extra things in as well when we republished. But so there is a great deal of material that, that demonstrates, you know, the, this guy who wrote Arrows in the Dark defending Hubbard claims to have been trained in Branch One the uh, covert data collection division of Scientology or harassment squad. And he's claiming Hubbard didn't know about this. Yet when you, re you read the 800 page training manual, the information full hat, which um, I put online in the 1990s, and I'm hoping most of it's still up there. Nearly all of that pack is written by Hubbard. Um, and there are lectures by Hubbard about how to do these things. There's even a telling public admission in one of the most famous Hubbard lectures, Ron's Journal 1967, called RJ67. He talks about uh, not... Um, oh, you know what? Uh, hold on one sec, John, because we're, we're just about to come up on the break. And I, do, I definitely want to talk about uh, RJ67 because it's such a fascinating... Uh, subject and, and uh, piece of Scientology history. So uh, we'll 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 continue uh, the conversation uh, in the second hour with John Atak, the author of "Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky." So stay tuned.
Space. American. It's practically narcotic. Freedom. Oh, yes. I like very much. Radio. You're an American institution. American Freedom Radio. Since the beginning, civilizations have risen and fallen. Rome, ancient Persia, Mongolia, Britain, and now America. Befallen by natural disasters, broken families, moral decay, lack of preparedness and conflict. Don't let this happen to you. Are you prepared? Would you like to help others prepare? AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com is looking for distributors. Email BugOutAmerica at USA.com Go to AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com A veteran-owned and operated company. But do it today. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like, my family has literally disowned me. <laughs> American Freedom Radio, Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the, the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network and, uh, and we just need that so much. And when we're not invading some sovereign nation or setting it on fire from the air, which is more fun for our Nintendo pilots, then, then we're usually declaring war on something here at home. Did you ever notice that about us? We love to declare war on things here in America. Anything we don't like about ourselves, we declare war on it. We don't do anything about it. We just declare war on it. It's the only metaphor, the only metaphor we have in our public discourse for solving problems, declaring war. We have to declare war on everything. We have a war on crime, the war on poverty, the war on litter, the war on cancer, the war on drugs. But you ever notice, we got no war on homelessness, huh? No war on homelessness. You know why? There's no money in that problem. No money to be made off of the homeless. If you could find a solution, if you could find a solution to homelessness where the corporate swine and the politicians could steal a couple of million dollars each, you'd see the streets of America begin to clear up pretty quick. I'll guarantee you that. I will guarantee you that. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio and service to the community with strength, wisdom and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio at Ymail.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs and artillery batteries not included. Launch sequence initiated. Mind to experience American Freedom Radio. Hawkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything. 
geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redmond. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. I am your host, Pierce Redman. If you are joining us uh, here in the second hour, we have been speaking with John Atak, the writer of Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky. We've been discussing uh, the book, his his work researching the founder of Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard, um, lots of different stuff. Of course, I mean, uh, John, I'll, I'll have to try and uh, beg you to come back on the show again because there's, I mean, we're just scratching the surface of uh, so many different things. Um, mm. But uh, just before uh, the break there, you were uh, mentioning uh, RJ67. Uh, and I just yep. wanted you to finish that because it's it's a, a very important uh, part of Scientology, and particularly the, the sort of history of Scientology. So um, uh, continue what you were saying there. Yeah. Uh, Hubbard uh, recorded a, a talk, um, which, which was called Ron's Journal 1967 or RJ67. It's one of the most played Hubbard lectures in Scientology. He announces the discovery of a true OT level, an operating Thetan level, um, which he will call Section 3 of the OT course. He says he has broken through a wall of fire and uh, put him, you know, nearly died, broke his back, various things, he claims. Um, <clears throat> in that lecture, which is publicly available, he he talks about, not bothering with the dogs yapping at the wheels of your fire engine when you're driving to the fire. So, you know, we ignore criticism, we ignore attacks upon us. And then about 10 minutes later, he says that his wife, the um, controller of the Guardian's office, the head of the uh, harassment teams, has hired professional intelligence agents to inquire into the background of Press Baron Cecil King and the British Prime Minister, Harold Wilson. So we have this quite typical double bind that he's saying, don't bother with these people, mm. but I'm bothering with them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, this little phrase that's dropped in, professional intelligence agents. Now, he's not saying private detectives. And in fact, what had happened was they'd hired a private detective who later got very upset and, and told the press what, had, what he'd been asked to do. But what we're being offered is the notion that he's got ex-CIA people or something now going, you know, searching through material about public figures. This would be the first admission of the program Snow White, where he would try to um, find negative material on powerful figures, which could then be used against them, um, which I think he was probably successful at, judging by the incredible defense mounted for Scientology by uh, various political figures over the years. Um, it's very surprising to me that the Secretary of State uh, and even presidents have criticized the German government for their restrictions on Scientology, saying that this is uh, an act against religion in some yeah, way. Yeah, Bill Clinton, famously. Bill, Bill Clinton. Um, Clinton, it seems, you know, he said he was at Oxford with a Scientologist. I think that Scientologist was a man called Richard Reese, who is no longer with us. Uh, who was a prominent Scientologist. And so Clinton was affected um, by his relationship with this guy without understanding that they'd put 11 people into prison for serious offences, including kidnapping, false imprisonment, um, pretending to be government officials, uh, burglary, breaking and entering, uh, bugging. Was, was on the list. They put 11 of these people. So when the Germans sort of go, well, we don't want these people in the civil service, it's based upon what happened in the US, where they even had a police lieutenant who was hacking police computers to give them information so they could keep Meisner hidden. So the, the loyalty of the Scientologist, as Hubbard himself declares, has to be to Scientology, can't be to anywhere else. So the German action is not a, anything to do with religion. It's to do with common sense that you know they were also convicted in france and in canada of infiltrating government officers i chased up the two guys they had in the home office here 
in Britain at that time, it was it was quite commonplace. Hubbard was thrown out of Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, Rhodesia as it then was, because he'd ordered one of his underlings to infiltrate a government office and steal documents. So it was, you know, it's a quite usual practice. Mm. There's a famous uh, case in, in France, and I, I can't remember the name. There is a documentary. I'll try and find it. I'll, we'll put it in the mm-hmm. show notes. But uh, like a legal case in France where it's like the only time in French history where, I don't know, thousands of documents went missing uh, mm-hmm. that were, uh, you yeah, know, this case style. against Scientology. And it's basically some Scientologists broke in, uh, you know, to like the French equivalent of the Supreme Court. And just carted out tons and tons of documents. It's like the only recorded time this has ever happened. Uh, mm. And that's more, than, more or less openly, yes, it was Scientology that did it. Yeah, well, if you look at the US cases, there were, I mean, let's front end this. Scientology is the most litigious organization in the history of the known universe. Yes. <laughs> um, they were able trillion to drop- years of it. Yeah, in the last 60 trillion years, this is a cold-blooded and factual account of our litigation. On the, When the IRS capitulated and rolled over for reasons that nobody has ever explained um, publicly, um, Scientology was able to drop 3,000 lawsuits that day. And they'd previously dropped hundreds here and hundreds there. So, you know, again, a part of the sacred scripture as they call it, of Scientology, is is uh, a piece called um, The Scientologist, a manual on the dissemination of material from 1955, where he talks, he, where he says the law can be used very easily to harass. And of anybody who practices Scientology without a license, he says, if possible, ruin him utterly. Mm. We'll later have the famous fair game law in 1965, where tricking, lying, suing and destroying are options available to treat with people such as myself um so this and this is a religion apparently this is a protected religious practice uh, for scientology so but when they were setting up the uh, infiltration of, of uh, the justice department they first of all um, made a legal motion that forced the IRS to collect all of their material in one place so they could then go and steal it. <laughs> so you know, they, they, were, they were astonishingly competent at doing this, you know, for the few years that they did it. The, the problem has always been that whenever they get close to victory, they score a massive own goal. You know, they'll do something that... I mean, with me, if they, frankly, if they'd kept on going for a couple of months longer, I probably, you know, I might even have signed a silence contract because uh, they came after me pretty hard. Mm. But they didn't. They, their, you know, their attention wavered and off they went, um, doing something else. Seeing the incompetence with which they've dealt with Leah Romini and her, you know, quite remarkable public statement about them, you know, that it's made Scientology now extraordinarily well known. Yes. Uh, <laughs> A subject, you know, and I think it's a whole genre. I think, you know, you've got science fiction and westerns and Scientology. It's there's a whole genre of movies to come out of this. And um, you know, I, I did, I did, I have a, a, along the t- the way tried to persuade uh, Paul Haggis that uh, it would be great if we made something about Hubbard. Oh but, my God! Yes, yeah. Well, there was that, the. Have you, have you seen the Master? Yeah, and it, it's it, kind it's, of. It's awful the way it was diluted. I was approached when they were first setting it up. Um, and, uh, you know, by that time, I wasn't really very interested in doing this kind of, this kind of stuff. Um, and it, it was a shame having two of the greatest actors of the generation, um, Joaquin Phoenix and Philip Seymour Hoffman. And the script had to just was watered down and watered down and watered down until, in the end, it was no longer the story of Hubbard. It was evidently based upon Hubbard. But I think that's the beginning. And I think, um, you know, Louis Theroux's rather strange documentary, which said a great deal more about Mark Rathbun than it did about Scientology, yeah, right? Um, but was very interesting on those grounds. But even that, it goes off into the realms of the crazy. You know, the miscavige is what? Having people lick the carpet? You know what I mean? Uh, the musical chairs incident. Yeah. And... yeah. The, so th- these astonishing things that have happened. 
Um, you wanted to talk about Janice Grady's book, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I we don't have to get into too much detail, but um, I, you know, I it uh, well, I guess it, you know, you just mentioned Leah Remini's show, um, and uh, of course uh, through uh, uh, her show, Scientology: The Aftermath, is is probably I think that one of the first um, times. Uh, that it's sort of been uh, known, uh, you know, across the globe of the sexual abuse in Scientology um, yeah. is, is in part because of that. And I, you know, I don't consider myself an expert, but I've been a, you know, a, a Scientology watcher uh, and fascinated by it since I was in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I had never really heard of that. I'd heard, of course, there's the weirdness of uh, the Commodore's messengers. Um, mm. But I guess I, I kind of wanted to, uh, talk a little bit about that because um, that it seems to be something bubbling under the surface. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the abuse of uh, children and other people. I mean, you look at the Danny Masterson right now, uh, mm-hmm. accused of raping, I think, at least three women. And it seems yeah. very clear that Scientology was protecting um, him in some way. Uh, mm-hmm. But as you said, uh, Janice Grady has a new book that's coming out, Commodore's Messenger. Uh, uh, you have a review of it we'll link to on uh, the underground bunker and there's even a little excerpt in it but um yeah i mean just uh, what is it? i mean because the commoner's messenger is, is this strange outfit you know of children basically that followed hubbard around uh and sort of you know um they were able to rise up i mean miscavige was a uh, part of the uh commoner's messengers Mm -hmm. Um, Many of the people, um, you know, in that age group, I mean, are now in very powerful positions. Of course, they were famous for being the sort of messengers. You know, Mm -hmm. if Hubbard had to tell somebody something, he told one of these kids who then went and told someone else. So I just wanted to get your your take on that. And and also um, any kind of insight into the possibility of of, uh, sexual abuse uh, that was going on. Okay. Um, Well, the. Janice, uh, her brother Peter, and her sister Terry were the first three Commodore's messengers um, on board the ship in, I think, 1968. Um, Janice was with Hubbard pretty much daily for the next 10 or 11 years. Um, I, in my initial review, um, actually confused an episode recorded in Steve Canane's exceptional book, Fair Game, um, which is a history of Scientology in Australia and is just splendidly researched. <laughs> this guy did such a good job. And he's, he's a lovely guy too. Um, and, I, you know, I don't know, I got to know him about three years before it was published and, and we became friends and um, I did whatever. But I confused an account that her sister had made in there about Hubbard trying to kiss her mm-hmm. when she was about 12 or 13. And Janice... Janice seems to, her, her view seems to be that, you know, Hubbard meant well, um, that she didn't see him drunk, she didn't see him taking drugs, he didn't approach her in any way, and that's her experience, and that's how she recounts it. I think the idea of having preteen and teenage children, taking them away from their education, um, and turning them into, I mean, they would wash him, which has always been a matter of concern for yeah. me. They would light, light his cigarettes. They would have a tape recorder by him so that, you know, if he farted or, or said anything uh, fascinating, that could be recorded for all posterity. <laughs> um, I actually talked with the guy who was the head of Ron's technical compilations, and he said, you know, he recorded every word he said <laughs> from, you know, the last 10 years of his life or something, and we've, right. we haven't even got it all transcribed. You know? um, but it, it's how they're able to, you know, continue to produce, you know, like the infamous OT8 bulletin. Right, and they, that's how they keep selling people books and CDs and stuff. Yeah, and I mean... The, just as a side note, the only book that he wrote is Dianetics, Modern Science and Mental Health. Every other Scientology book, and I count 28 books in the canon, was actually edited, compiled by somebody else from notes or or mm. from lectures, that, that he never even had the energy to write a second book. Um, Science of Survival, which was meant to be the second book, was actually written by Richard DeMille who yet again would become a professor of psychology after mm. working 
Hubbard and had a pretty negative view of him. Um, in fact, he, he agreed with me that, that the only perfect suppressive person was probably Ron Hubbard himself. <laughs> um, uh, he wrote two two other books, then a guy called Alfie Hart put them together, and then nearly everything up till 1978 was actually written or, or compiled by John Sanborn, um, including the famous Hymn of Asia, which originally said, I am Maitreya, I am Maitreya, the, the Buddha prophesied. Right, you know, right, right. Um, in the book of the great deceased. Well, yes. when I interviewed John, who John said he left Scientology because he was asked to put another million dollars in Hubbard's bank account, and he'd been living on five dollars a week for twenty-four years, and he just went, "This is wrong," and left. Um, but he said that the original draft of this, which he was given in nineteen fifty-four and asked to publish, said, "I am Matea," and he finally figured out in about nineteen seventy-three that if he changed two words round he could if he put am i then he could get away with publishing this thing um <laughs> curiously the first thing i did when i got into scientology because i came from a soto zen background the first thing i did was write to the polytech society the first week and say look this guy claims to be mateo tell me what what you can and they wrote back and said this is nonsense yes this <laughs> no is prophecy it. of a red-headed man rising in the west two and a half thousand years after. right right and I would later read the book of the Great Decease, which in, in, indeed does not say any of those things. Mm. Um, but yeah, so he he didn't write the books. Returning to the, the sexual theme, I think that he became uh, sexually impotent in the 1960s because of his massive. He, he not only abused drugs, of course, he abused penicillin. Imagine this. He, he for some quite a long period of time thought that by injecting himself with penicillin in the late 40s and early 50s, that, that he could, you know, would never be sick again. <laughs> so it's, I don't think he quite understood the nature of antibiotics. No. <laughs> but I think he he pretty much wrecked himself. And by the mid-60s, I don't think he was sexually competent anymore. Mm. So, and I think that's why his sexuality is exhibited by putting teenagers, both boys and girls, into hot pants, you know, Yep. And, and having them represent him there are a couple of very unpleasant stories one of them it is said that he confessed during a, an auditing session that he had sexually molested one of his own children who was 14 at the, the time and that he confessed this to mary sue who got up and left the session and the reason we know about it is because he then complained to another Scientology auditor that Mary Sue had abandoned him during a session, which was a violation of the auditor's code. Mm. He, in passing, said it, and all I'd done was say that I'd had sex with one of our children. You know? Right, yeah, you know, come on, get over it. Yeah, so you get something that extreme. As Hubbard said, when you become too incredible, you become invisible. So it's very easy for somebody to go, well, okay, what's John Azek doing saying these things? Well, I got that from the case supervisor who had overlooked the folder of the session for Hubbard's auditor. That's where it came from. And um, she is a woman I trust absolutely. She's one of the few people in this world that I trust absolutely. Mm. And and it made her, she'd done the class eight course with Hubbard, the OT3 auditing course with Hubbard. It made her walk away. She saw, saw that and went. There's also a story which, as far as I recollect, comes from And Andre Taboyan, who said that he walked in on Hubbard in Morocco, right. um, raping a twelve-year-old rent boy. So there are statements about Hubbard that that not really solid enough ground, I don't think, to to make an assertion from something to be cautious of. But when you look at Scientology and its history of pr protecting sexual abusers, you have a different story. Mm. Um, Steve Kinane, who I mentioned uh, a moment ago, the Australian journalist, he recorded an interview with a, a woman uh, called Carmen, uh, who from the age of six to the age of 11 um, was sexually abused um, by her Scientologist stepfather. At 11, she went to the police and she was convinced by Jan Eastgate, who was the head of the Citizens Commission on Human Rights, right? Yes, another she, front group. Yeah, she convinced, but human rights, you know, she yeah, convinced right. that 
11-year-old girl to withdraw allegations of sexual abuse. The guy who abused her has since been convicted, right? So there's no doubt it happened. <laughs> she had to spend five more years in the house with him because of Jan Eastgate and the Citizens Commission. Um, Ursula Caberta, who was um, a politician in Hamburg, who pretty much is the motivating force behind the German laws involving uh, Scientology. There were some people in Baden-Württemberg as well who were instrumental, but Ursula was 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 really convinced about Scientology. She researched and wrote a book about um, sexual abuse in Scientology, but it's in German. Nobody's got round to translating it yet. I've seen cases in the US uh, and I've seen cases in the UK where children were sexually abused and it was covered up by Scientology. Um, I mean, we've started to see this as a commonplace. The Jehovah's Witnesses are said to have a list of 23,000 abusers, which right. they will share with um, the authorities. And they lost a major case in the UK in 2015. And they've got another case with, I think, 25 plaintiffs in Belgium. Um, and, you know, hopefully attitudes are changing a little bit and, and this, these cover-ups which have been endemic in our society will, you know, it will stop being permissible to uh, allow this kind of thing to happen, let's hope. Mm. But Scientology is certainly implicated in that. And it, it is this whole, you know, tradition of cover-up. If, if we tell the truth about what's happened here, then people will think we're a bad organisation. And it's kind of, yeah, and they'll be right. You know? <laughs> oh, right. No, I mean, because it's not just that. I mean, it, it's people uh, dying mysteriously. Uh, I mean, we, we mentioned in the first hour, uh, Quentin Hubbard. I mean, the, yep. he it probably committed suicide. And that was yes. sort of covered up, um, you know, and, uh, and or, or the way that just, you know, Hubbard airbrushes, you know, certain wives out of his life, you know, anything yep. negative. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it's more just the culture of, of Scientology to do this. And, and if it's um, uh, something like a suicide or uh, the abuse of a child or, or of an adult, um, you know, it, it's all kind of the same. Uh, you know, yeah. they're, they're not really uh, parsing this out. Um, I think that, if anything, that's what's so uh, chilling about it. Like, you, you know, you're just saying this woman who's supposed to be the head of a human rights organization mm -hmm. convincing a child. Uh, to basically not go to the police. I mean, that yes. is it. Uh, I mean, the, the 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 sort of casual nature with which Scientologists will will do this. That's what's so frightening. Um, yeah. Because then it can really be about anything. It could be about murder. Uh, it could be you know um, what. I mean, you know, name a name a a, a crime. Um, it, essentially, they, they could just sort of say that about anything. And and I think we you know I think Ed Snowden kind of exemplifies this situation by being somebody who was loyal to the law and the constitution and the people rather than being loyal to the criminals yeah. who were and and he's in this situation where he's considered a traitor because he was disloyal to the criminals who were flouting the law and there was nothing else he could have done than what he did do and I'm, i rather hope that that culture you know that let us be loyal to to morality. Let us, you know, stand fast by our morality rather than um, protecting, you know, these abusers. The kind of because we have the Jimmy Savile case here, oh, a man who, yeah, I mean, literally everybody knew. Over five hundred cases have been brought against him. Uh, a child as young as two, a woman as old as ninety. He had the keys to one of our psychiatric hospitals and could go around the wards. You know, he had the support of the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, uh, and of, of um, Edwina Curry, who was one of her ministers. And the police received many complaints about this man. And, you know, nothing nothing at all happened. Hopefully that culture is going to change. You know, I think this is the next stage in human evolution where we actually show care for human other human beings rather than this pretense of care that has been so usual. Well, it, it, and it does seem as if there is, uh, you know, I mean, knock on wood, but uh, a groundswell. Uh, I mean, you, you know, you, you see, I mean, at least it's now come to light, you know, the Jimmy Savile stuff. It's not mm -hmm. something you can talk about in sort of hushed whispers 
like mm-hmm. apparently everybody at the BBC was. Now yep. it is front and center. I mean, you see the stuff that's going on in Hollywood right now, uh, mm-hmm. where apparently everyone is a is a, a, a horrible sex offender or a pervert or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and of course, I mean, again, Leah Remini is just sort of. I mean, they, Scientology can't hide now. I mean, because she's putting yeah. them on blast every week. Um, yeah. you know, um, so, you know, hats off to, for, to her for that. Um, but, um, uh, John, you, I, I wanted to, uh, uh, talk a little bit about, um, you know, your life after Scientology and what you're doing right now. Um, is, because of, of course, life after Scientology. Yeah. Well, you know, cause that's always a thing, you know, it, um, and I think it, I'm sure you could talk about that. I mean, the, the transition has got to be a bit odd. Um, but, uh, what are you up to right now? What's your, what's your focus? Well, I, I, left the Scientology field in January 1996. I, I decided that as nobody was going to protect me <laughs> uh, and nobody was going to support me and nobody was going to, you know, give me the money to do this, that, that I was an idiot carrying on. And by then I'd, I'd been bankrupted. I'd lost a five bedroom house. My marriage had collapsed. Uh, my health had collapsed. And, you know, so I decided to move away. But my interest by then in, in the last five or six years, from the late 80s, had really moved into how is this stuff working? And I'd understood that Scientology was a microcosm, that the normal so- psychology of human beings was was what was important here. It, there wasn't anything aberrant or weird. People in groups act in particular ways. So I went through the standard texts. I, I read you know, Robert J. Lifton's work. And found out about his model of thought reform. I I came to know some of the experts. Um, Jolly West was a good friend, uh, the LA based uh, psychiatrist. Uh, Margaret Singer came to know Margaret. Uh, Stephen Hassan, who remains a good friend of mine, mm. and I became more and more interested in this this field of mind control. And it seemed to me that understanding normal psychology was the first part of it. So things like confirmation bias where we tend to accept information that agrees with us and we tend to reject information that doesn't. Um, I said earlier that that the noetic sense, the sense of certainty that we have, that fascinates me. And I think it's it's something we all need to be aware of. You know, we need to be more careful about that. Cognitive dissonance, that um, anything that disagrees with our views, we will either just absolutely reject or it will make us feel wobbly it will make us feel um uneven so i I, you know spent a long time i then started looking at other organizations i read about tens of different uh, so-called cult groups um going right back through history i i read a history histories of religion that that you know took me back to the the misties who are the origin of scientology these first gnostics who went through you know dating right back to the Eleusinian mysteries in perhaps, you know, almost 2000 BC, these things come along. The Mithraean religion of the Roman Empire, where you would experience death so that you would understand that we never die. You know, this kind of, you know, (laughs) putting a coffin underground or something. Um, The basis of the Freemasons, the basis of the Rosicrucians and later Gnostic societies, which have levels of initiation where you're meant to learn something. Um, Some people call Scientology a a neo-Gnostic belief for that reason. Hubbard, of course, got it from the Rosicrucians. He was a member of Amok, the ancient and mystical order of the Rosy Cross, um, as, a, as a very young man. Um, I became interested in you know, how you integrate these things, sociological ideas, social psychology, clinical psychology. And before I even left the work on Scientology, I was going to other people in the counter-cult world and saying, you know, we found things out that would be useful in other areas, and we should be encouraging a multidisciplinary approach. Then as terrorism became more of an issue for me, before 9-11 in the 90s, I started reading about terrorism. Again, well, Bader Meinhof, the Red Brigades, these are just political cults. They're mm. groups, they're, they're kind of religious cult plus violence, you know, Um and so I looked at the notion of de-radicalization when that term started coming along and radical no, no longer meant a, a hippie with political beliefs as it used to in the 60s, but um, right, meant right. Some, you know, an Islamist who wanted to blow things up. And as I looked at the cases of 
particular radicalized people, I saw that the process they were going through was, you know, very much the normal social dynamics uh, are used. There is then an aspect of thought reform on top of that. And there are then emotional states um, or is induced in people. And you have this, again, my, my colleague Yuval Laor points out that if you've seen something true or that something that appears miraculous, then you will believe everything else the source of that um, act or information does. So, you know, if if a chiropractor manages to click your back into place and you feel better, you'll be prone to take whatever vitamins or minerals or salt. You know, that's one of my favorite people who sell you salt. Um, <laughs> God, it's meant to be bad for you, isn't it? I, I get this thing where I, I get this thing, this leaflet that said that this salt contains 60 elements. And so I wrote to the people who published it and said, which 60? And they went, oh, well, we don't really know. Yes. Like, has it got phosphorus in it? Has it got radium in it? You know, I mean, has it got uranium in it? You know, what are these? And why do I need these things? You know, but they, you know, miracle cures. I start, you know, I looked at the whole of the New Age movement as best I as I could, and I realised that there are just certain dynamics in human behaviour. It, it, finally, um, I was talking. I was talking with Steve Hassan back in uh, 2012 about this, and saying, you know, we really need to teach people in the terrorist world how we exit counsel somebody because i can take a or could i haven't done this for over 20 years if david miscavige is listening um but i i used to i had a five-year period where i would exit counsel fanatical committed members of scientology and nobody who listened to me stayed in the cult not one person and you only had a day to do it because they'd go and, you know, nowadays you've got cell phones, so you haven't got any time to do it. But they'd go and phone somebody, you know. So I could take anybody, you know, people who that morning, had one go who that morning had given a success story on finishing a course and was over the moon with Scientology. By the evening, he decided that he didn't really want to do it anymore. All done just on information, just by showing the contradictions, by getting the person to talk about the red flags that, that they had, you know, why do they dress in sailor suits? Why does it cost half a million dollars? You know, these simple sort of things. Why do people shout at people? Why are people on rice and beans diet? Whatever they'd seen along the way, that, that they would then develop another perspective. Then I heard about Nasir Abbas. Nasir Abbas was involved in the Bali bombings. Uh, he was in a, a group called Al Jamilaya, if I've remembered my Arabic properly. I apologize if I haven't. And he was caught by the Indonesian authorities. Now, they normally torture people. That's how they go about finding things out, I'm afraid. Uh, it's part of the judicial procedure in Indonesia, in Israel, in India. There are a number of countries that still torture people in interrogation, which is horrific and should not be done. Um, Indonesia would normally do that. They didn't. They sat him down for three days with a, a mullah who explained to him how he'd violated the Quran. So he pretty much exit counseled him. At the end of that time, he gave them the safe houses, the weapons, and the names of the people in the organization. Now, if you look at the success of Guantanamo Bay in comparison, the amount of man hours spent in humiliating and abusing oh, yeah. those people. Going nowhere. Yeah. So they did the right thing. They exit counseled this guy. And so... I, then we started looking at, Steve had been looking at human trafficking, and we look at, uh, I've, I've read quite a lot about gangs, um, you know, particularly the things like the Crips, I'm quite interested in Tookie Williams' accounts of, of his life, remarkable man. Uh, the gangs in England, in North England, the scuttlers in the late 19th century, the 1870s, there'd be 500 of them out on the streets of Manchester beating the hell out of each other and any policeman who turned up on a Saturday night. And it, the comparisons between them and the, the Crips or the Hells Angels are remarkable that you find so many similarities of them you know, making themselves an in-group and the rest of society an out-group, their uniforms, their language, their that isolation. So I talked with Steve about this and he went off and he found this amazing guy called Richard Kelly, who grew up in the Jehovah's Witnesses and then over 50 years ago left, telling the head of the organization what he thought of him quite publicly at the time. He came back to try and help um, Jehovah's Witnesses after his sister was murdered. 
uh, a few years ago. And he's written three remarkable books about his own experiences and his about his sister. Um, and he came along and said, well, you know, let's do something. So I then went to one of my brothers, who's, who's a very successful guy, and we found some other people. We, we created the Open Minds Foundation. We have um, the support of quite a lot of academics. We, we have uh, Philip Zimbardo on our advisory board. Um, we have Bob Cialdini. Uh, the author of the wonderful book Influence. If, you know, if you're going to go away and read a book as a consequence of listening to this, read that book Influence by Bob Cialdini. Great book. We have Anthony Pakarnis, who uh, co-wrote Age of Propaganda, and read that after Influence. Fantastic, amazing book. Um, so we've we've collected quite a lot of people from all around the world, and we've put up a website, the Open Minds Foundation. And at the moment, our intention is to have a website that's free to use, which will have accessible information for anybody on questions that relate to manipulation, coercive control, undue influence, thought reform, brainwashing, call it what you will. Um, We're now developing our first videos. At the moment, I think our site is probably accessible to most people who've have a you know a secondary level of education, but I'd like to bring it back so that it it's accessible to twelve year olds you know who are just beginning their secondary education, because I think that's the that's where it's gone wrong that our educational system. Um, my friend Ira Chaleff, is a very dear friend of mine, uh, wrote a wonderful book called Intelligent Disobedience, and uh, if you go on Google and put in Think Blink Choice Voice, you'll get his little video for five year olds. Showing them to, you know, how they can say, "Well, hang on a minute, that that doesn't sound right to me." <laughs> um, we have such a, an obedient-based society, as if obedience was a necessity. I think it's based on the possibly the Judeo-Christian notion that we're all born in original sin, and so we have to be controlled and told what to do. And you know the problem is yes there is a there are a small percentage of people who are antisocial very small according to the experts certainly less than three percent of people are naturally antisocial um they do need to be controlled um we do need to regulate them but we're extending that to the other 97 percent of the population and people are not taught how to assert themselves how to withdraw how to you know, not involve themselves in such things. So I wrote a book, and I should be promoting this, shouldn't I? I shouldn't be promoting Bob Cialdini's book. Forget that. Um, I wrote a book called Opening Minds, which um, Michael Langoni at the International Cultic Studies Association, ICSA, said that it was the first time that anybody had gone to such detail about the correspondence between the different areas of manipulation. Um, and you know, I I think that, you know, this is where my work is now. How can we spot predators um, without, you know, it's not for any of us to diagnose somebody a psychopath, a sociopath, a narcissist to say they have Machiavellian personality disorder or borderline personality disorder or what have you. That's a thing for professionals. But we can observe that some people are predatory. And whatever their diagnosis, people who boast a lot, People who flatter us, you know, who love bombers, um, people who take risks, people who seem to have, uh, you know, need great stimulation to, to get any sort of emotional um, effect. These people need, to, we need to be aware of them. We need to be, and there have been a flood of books about psychopaths and sociopaths, some really fine work, which make it clear that this is still not an exact science. Um, I don't know if it ever will be. I mean, we have differentiations in the diagnostic and statistical manual that we have. They they know the word psychopath and the word sociopath disappeared from the American Psychiatric Association's vocabulary. Mm. This book came out in 2012, which is quite a thought um, because the the definitions have become so um, confusing. They have the antisocial personality disorder. Which, as far as I can, if the work of Kent Keel is right, he's done um, fMRI scans on about you know 400 or so 
uh, criminal psychopaths, and he's found that they have a deficit in the paralimbic system. Now, that deficit averages only 7%. It's not missing, but they all seem to have it, in which case criminal psychopathy is not an antisocial personality disorder. It's not a personality disorder at all. It's a brain defect. So the APA have got, got it wrong there. Um, you then have the narcissistic disorders, and we get into this thing that, that some part of it might be biological or genetic. There are alleles that are um, associated with psychopathy, as a um, neurologist called James Fallon, who wrote a book called The Psychopath Inside, because he discovered from a brain scan that he actually has a psychopath brain. He also has the alleles, and he also, in his uh, background, on his father's side, his mother points out, seven murderers, <laughs> including Lizzie Borden. And um, so, but he is what's called a pro social psychopath. He is somebody who will, you know, he, he talks about, uh, he found out about Marburg in Kenya and he wanted to go there where Marburg Ebola comes from. And he went to the Bat Cave uh, where Marburg Ebola first came from and he took his brother there. And his brother only realized when he got home the risk that he'd been exposed to. So Fallon still has the risk-taking aspect of the psychopath. And, uh, you know, you don't want to go to a bar with him, basically. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, or a cave well, in, in Africa or something. Yeah, exactly. You'll end up dancing naked on the table if you do, and he'll be laughing at you. But um, it shows that there are variations, but uh, I think, it, as with Shakespeare, you know, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. I think the same is true f for antisocial behavior, and that our society actually acclaims certain psychopathic behaviors. We, we respect, you know, some of these characters who have been rapacious villains, you know. Um, the, you know, as you say, as after people have died, the, the, the good is often turned within their bones. Uh, it's not true. It, often they're seen in a in a, a nicer light, you know, a, um, a better light. Um, because you have this complexity of behavior in human beings. And if you have a society that promotes exhibitionism, that promotes a celebrity culture where people are celebrities because they're celebrities, not because, not naming the Kardashians or anybody at this point, not because of anything they've achieved in the world, but because they're celebrities. And you've got a culture where, you know, more and more kids when they're in surveys, you know, 40% of children are saying, you know, when, when asked what they want to do when they grow up, they want to be a celebrity. You know? Yeah, it's so disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than having the focus of doing something good in the world or achieving something wonderful. And I, and I, think, I, think, we, I think we are possibly, you know, about to see a shift in culture in the Western world, at least in the, the world where there is enough food uh, for 75 percent of people um, that that we will see possibly a development of uh, compassion. Um, I think that we've put too much emphasis on empathy, which is an automatic reaction. And, and I speak as somebody who tests as a super empath. Um, I, I can score almost 100% on the test for this. And it's a handicap because you find yourself doing things because of how you feel and how you feel somebody else must feel um, rather than what is being called rational compassion where you work out. So um, I wrote a, wrote a co-wrote a piece about what's called a weaponized empath. Um, which is on our website at Open Minds, because I was astonished. There's a documentary about Heinrich Himmler called The Decent One. And every word in it is taken from Himmler himself, from his journals, the orders he gave, from his letters. And you get this perverse notion that the man who headed the extermination program for the Nazis was an empath. He wasn't a sadistic, destructive psychopath. He had been convinced that he was saving humanity. And when he writes, you know, to German soldiers saying, you know, I know I've made you do terrible things, but in the evening, drink German beer and sing German songs and 
speak German philosophy, we are making the world a better place. So even empathetic people can be twisted. Mm. And I, I guess you know the example I often come back to is Hill and Knowlton, the advertising agency, when they schooled a 15-year-old, the 15-year-old daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador in the congressional hearings. And she went into hearings and wept and said that she'd been in Kuwait City when the Iraqis came in in, what, 1991. And they tipped the babies out of the incubators. Now, that hit our empathy, didn't it? Mm. Well, the problem is that she wasn't in Kuwait City. She was shopping with her dad in New York that day. Hill and Knowlton later admitted and, and were never charged with a criminal offence, to my oh. amazement, you know? Oh, then, even though that was when, that was the, you know, we, we, we had to go to war after that. And yeah. that's still brought up to this day. I mean, it, it's still, um, you know, again, you, you, uh, the, the undue influence that uh, certain people have. I mean, that is still kind of believed to some extent. Or, or it's like, uh, well, maybe it's not true, but the sentiment is right. You know, you'll get yeah. a lot of that as well. Yeah, they they, they wanted to tip the babies out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. They may not have actually done it, but they yeah, exactly. They wanted to do that. They're the kind of people that do that. Yeah. I, I mean, um, there was a British MP called Eric Ponsonby, uh, who in the 1920s wrote a book about World War One propaganda, which is a wonderful little book. And as an MP, he had access to everything. And one of the great stories when um, the Germans invaded Belgium. Uh, Hitler would later say that World War One was not lost on the battlefield, but because of British propaganda. And I think there is some truth to that. Um, so the story was put out that the German soldiers were chopping the hands off babies. Mm. And um, Ponsonby, there was a Belgian investigation after the war. There was a U.S. government investigation after the war, both of which found no evidence of this or of the crucified soldier, which is one of the other World War One stories. These stories went all through the media in, in Britain. And when Ponsonby finally found the man who'd made the story up, who was a colonel in British intelligence, the guy laughed and he said, you wouldn't believe how many thousands of letters I received from people who wanted to adopt these babies. That's empathy. Empathy is automatic. It's not a bad thing. But we have so many pundits now telling us that we have to develop our empathy. No, we have to develop our compassion and we have to be rational about it. We have to be able to assess the information without being emotionally overwhelmed so that we will go and commit horrors, you know, on behalf of manipulative people. Um, so I think that's very I think that's very important. Um, we are promoting at Open Minds, we're promoting healthy skepticism. We, we decided to throw away all of the technical psycho and, and just use words that make sense. And the word healthy is necessary because people think of skepticism as being like cynicism, you know, having a negative attitude towards everything, where really skepticism is being willing to test anything. And if you can do that without being aggressive or offensive, you know, um, agree, disagree agreeably, I, I put it, then that would be a move forward in our society if people really were able to say, I don't understand what you're saying. It doesn't make sense to me. Could you explain that? Do you have any evidence for that? Rather than just grabbing hold of, you know, some piece of information about damage to babies, which seems actually to be a commonplace throughout history, propaganda, you know, I mean, witches, they... Oh, of course. Uh, well, because, you know, who's, who's pro killing babies? <laughs> Nobody. Mm. You know, well, I mean, it, it, it's such an easy um, target. Yeah. And, and what, what do we react most readily to? You know, what is the, who are the most vulnerable humans? Absolutely. Um, and so these stories are told again and again. Um, we hear about the skull and bones group of, of Yale is sacrificing a baby every year. So you know, that's what George George Bush was actually doing, apparently. Um <laughs> These stories that inflame our passions, and I think you know that one of the commonest misconceptions is the idea that thought and feeling are separate in human beings. And the truth is that um, there was a neurologist who had a stroke and, and wrote a book about recovering her brain, which took her seven years to do. And she said something like, um, "We we we think that we are um, we believe that we are thinking animals." 
with feelings, but we're actually feeling animals with thoughts. That um, that's what subjectivity is. We start everything with how we feel about it, and there are many things which it's hard to you know is surprise an emotion or is it a thought? You know, mm-hmm. as it is a reaction. Uh, disgust. That's a primary reaction. Is it an emotion? Um, and w- you know, how is it that disgust seems to have been missed? You know, we, in the countercult world, they talk about inducing phobia and inducing guilt in people to control them. But disgust is the one that is the basis of all genocide. You know, if you really want a group of people to get with you, then you start talking about ragheads or. You know, you'd call Jews fleas or rats, Mm -hmm. vermin of some kind. You separate them out emotionally from us and you make them untouchable, to use the Indian expression. Why do we still trade with India, by the way? They have 13 million slaves in India. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, uh, Apartheid made us not trade with South Africa, but 13 million slaves? Why why are we still doing that? I I don't understand. Well, or, or, I mean, we, we, or that, I mean, Modi is basically a a Hindu fascist uh, that wants to, you know, wipe out all of the the Muslims in India. Um, I don't, I mean, you know, I, I, this is just my own uh, sort of semi cynical thought, but, you know, it's because, well, all their, you know, India, Hinduism, it's all spiritual, you know, eat, pray, love, all of this sort of Mm -hmm. nonsense. Yeah. Um, that we we project onto, and that's not to say that India is evil, but you know a lot of this is is a projection uh, mm-hmm. that we we put on India that they can do no wrong. It's the same way that um, you know Buddhas in Tibet, uh, they, well they uh, you know um, they were all wonderful, even though the Dalai Lama had slaves. Um, you know, and it mm-hmm. wasn't until the evil uh, communists and Mao um, uh, that that slavery was outlawed in Tibet in like the 1950s. That's um, but, uh, you know, that's the Dalai Lama is wonderful. And, you know, that Richard Gere and all these people are, are Buddhists. They can't they can't be bad. Um, John, we've got about maybe three minutes left. And I just wanted to um, uh, give it to you any kind of final thoughts and uh, where people can go to uh, to uh, uh, read uh, your work and all that sort of stuff. OK, well, um, somebody who knows nothing about Scientology and wants an introduction, uh, Scientology, the Cult of Greed. Uh, that's what it was written for. Um, somebody who wants to uh, dive more deeply, um, let's sell these people a piece of blue sky. There, there are also a lot of my blogs and articles online, um, readily searchable with my name. Uh, about 70 blogs on the underground bunker. If, you're, if you've left Scientology and you want to put your mind back together, then after selling Let's sell these people a piece of blue sky. Go to the bunker blogs. Uh, there are about 12 academic papers that I've published over the years, which are all up for free. Um, if you really want to get deeply into it, buy, uh, rent the Getting Clear videos from Toronto in 2015, where we had 27 experts talking over five days and completely deconstructed Scientology. As far as I know, this has never been done uh, to any other cult. Um, and you know, sadly, the countercult world has not really made any noise about it yet. I think they're just embarrassed and ashamed. Um, <laughs> my more recent work, um, I, I'm also a novelist. I have uh, two novels out, Voodoo Child's Slight Return and Halcyon Days. I've translated character by character the Chinese Dao Te Jing by Lao Tzu. That's available for a very reasonable price. Um which is where I came from. You know, at 17, I, I read Lao Tzu, and that has always remained to me a, a way of looking at the world, a kind of uh, Chinese stoicism. I'm, I'm probably more Jiang Tzu than Lao Tzu now, but um, nonetheless, that's available. And uh, Opening Minds, um, if anybody's interested in the aspects of mind and how we are convinced and persuaded um, opening minds the secret world of manipulation undue influence and brainwashing and you can find my blogs on the open minds foundation uh, website which is openmindsfoundation.org well uh, thank you so much john for uh, your best. time and for talking and like i said i'm gonna try and beg you to come back on because I, I have so much more i'd like to talk to you but anybody uh, anyway Thank you all so much for listening, and I will be talking to you very soon.
No rules. No rules. No taboo topics. No taboo topics. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. Since the beginning, civilizations have risen and fallen. Rome. Ancient Persia. Mongolia. Britain. And now, America. Befallen by natural disasters, broken families, moral decay, lack of preparedness and conflict. Don't let this happen to you. Are you prepared? Would you like to help others prepare? AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com is looking for distributors. Email BugOutAmerica at USA.com Go to AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com A veteran-owned and operated company. But do it today. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like, my family has literally disowned me. <laughs> American Freedom Radio, Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the, the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network and, uh, and we just need that so much. And when we're not invading some sovereign nation or setting it on fire from the air, which is more fun for our Nintendo pilots, then, then we're usually declaring war on something here at home. Did you ever notice that about us? We love to declare war on things here in America. Anything we don't like about ourselves, we declare war on it. We don't do anything about it. We just declare war on it. It's the only metaphor, the only metaphor we have in our public discourse for solving problems, declaring war. We have to declare a war on everything. We have a war on crime, the war on poverty, the war on litter, the war on cancer, the war on drugs. But you ever notice we got no war on homelessness, huh? No war on homelessness. You know why? There's no money in that problem. No money to be made off of the homeless. If you could find a solution, if you could find a solution to homelessness where the corporate swine and the politicians could steal a couple of million dollars each, you see the streets of America begin to clear up pretty quick. I'll guarantee you that. I will guarantee you that. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio and service to the community with strength, wisdom and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio at Ymail.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs and artillery batteries not included. Launch sequence initiated. Mind to experience American Freedom Radio.